Ladies and gents, one of the Carrot Corner coaches who's going to be on our roster when we launch our subscription service in March 2023 is the one and only Jared Alderman. We had a really cool two-hour show last week on the Twitch channel where Jared came on and we took some calls from poker players struggling with mental game issues. But before that, we just had a really great in-depth chat about the importance of presence at the poker table, curiosity, tilt minimization, how to disable the kind of unhelpful mental programs that your brain is going to try and run as you play poker, and how to just get way stronger in the mental game and performance side of the game. I think you'll really enjoy this. If you can set aside the time, I definitely recommend watching all of it, and do let us know what you think in the comments. All right, let's get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, oops, let's get rid of that horrible thing there. I bring you the one and only, Jalderman, a.k.a. Jared Alderman, no longer obscured by a search bar, a Windows search bar. How you doing, my friend? I'm good, man. How you doing? Yeah, I'm all right. All right. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to be ditching the uh, the Jalderman name here soon. I think I will just be Jared Alderman before long. Right. More uh, professional or another reason? Uh, Yeah, I just I associated like the Jalderman brand more with like my poker coaching and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and so just in the process of moving into a different field, just figured I'd build more of like a personal brand around my myself. It's also very confusing because you have like Jarrett man, Carrot man, Jowler man. There's another one as well. There's a fourth uh, man, I'm sure. Oh, uh, there's there's tons. I mean, yeah, uh, people who have followed me on Twitch love trolling me with the Jarrett man. So it was very, uh. Yeah, it's very. Uh, I've I've gotten that a lot, especially in Eastie's chat. If I'm ever doing something with Eastie, the amount of like references to to Jarrett Man's I get is far too many. The thing is that Jarrett Man is halfway in between Jalder Man and Carrot Man. If you think I've never it. heard Carrot Man. Do people call you that? No, it's like one of those things. Like you know, you have that kid in school that's like, oh yeah, my nickname's like. Hercules, but no one actually calls him Hercules. I think it's like that. Like, I want to be called the Carrot Man, but, like, no one really does it. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, my nickname is Hercules. <laughs> oh, I couldn't think of a, like, ridiculous amazing. thing that no, no one would ever call you because it's so egotistical. I don't know. That was that was a little too specific. I'm wondering now if you if you didn't <laughs> insist on going by Hercules in school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Oh. Oh, um, man. So cool. We are here today to. I'm going to turn my music down. Hold on. It's really too loud. We're here today to solve the mental game and performance related issues of the chat. By performance, we don't mean like performance in the bedroom or anything like that. We mean at the poker table. We mean your ability to, to show up. Well, how would you describe performance? Is it something like your ability mm -hmm. to show up and actually use the skills that you have built in poker, like your ability to translate what you know and what you know you could do if you were playing optimally at the tables on any given day. Yeah, that's a good that's a good definition. Usually the way that I describe it is closing the gap between what you feel you're capable of doing and what you are actually doing in that moment. So um, that doesn't always translate to utilizing all of your knowledge and skill in that moment because that's possibly not where you're at personally but it really does leave you feeling like you yeah like w when you look back on your performance you feel like yeah that was that was the best i could have done mm -hmm. and not looking back on it and thinking like i i could have done better and then also charting a path to raise the bar of what that is you know, that's sort of the coaching that I do is making sure that you're, yeah, that, that, that gap is as small as possible and that we have a clear path forward to, to raising what that bar is. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, do we want music or no music today, guys? This is not really our typical show where we're filling it with poker or anything. So would you rather we just turn the music off or do you want like some low level music of this volume? Let us know. Yeah. I think that makes a ton of sense. So you're, you're raising the ceiling as to what people could possibly achieve, but also getting them closer to the to that ceiling on average every every time that they that they play. Yeah. Um. I, would you say that like doing your best every time you sit down to play might actually be like I would I would just throw a spanner in the works there and say is that not an unrealistic goal? Like surely we can't we can't perform at our best level of performance very often at all. And is it just that we're trying to get closer to it? Or do you think that we can actually unlock something where we can um, do our, you know, 
perform to our maximum capacity almost every time. Yeah, I mean, the way that I sort of thread this needle is we're not trying to play without mistakes. We're trying to play without regrets. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a very big difference between those two. Um, so playing in like playing in such a way that you feel like you're like performing at your best. I mean, this becomes a very difficult thing to describe because like what is that's why I say it's your best. Like we're trying to close the gap between how you feel you could have played and what you did. It's not necessarily that you utilized every piece of knowledge and experience you have and that informed your play, but it's that whatever knowledge and experience was available to you in that moment that you were utilizing that in your decision making. And the, the reflection of that is usually a distinct lack of regret. Um, and not necessarily in a lack of feeling I made, I didn't make any mistakes. So like something we make mistakes all the time, but that's oftentimes we feel that that is, even though that was a mistake, that was the best I could have done in the moment. Um, yeah. but there's tons of people who are making mistakes that feel like that wasn't the best they could have done in the moment that mm. in that moment they had intuitions, knowledge, experience that was telling them they should do something other than that. And, and that's not what they did. And that's marked by a distinct feeling of regret after the decision point has happened. Mm. So we're trying to minimize regrets. Um, we're not trying to minimize mistakes necessarily. Like mm -hmm. mistakes are a huge part of uh, opening to the possibility of mistakes is a huge part of performing at our best. Knowing that we will not do play our best, if you will, all the time and not being afraid of that reality is a big part of how we actually bring the best that we have in that moment to that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what we're kind of saying is that we're always going to be fallible. We're always going to yeah. make mistakes and, and sometimes we will be functioning on higher brain power than other days. But what we're trying to do is yeah. not make the kind of mistakes where, you know, literally a split second afterwards we're like, God, I knew that there was something wrong with that and I didn't really slow down. I didn't take my time. I didn't go through yeah. my protocol. I haven't warmed up for this session. I'm, I've just done a bunch of things yeah. wrong that were very much within my control that I could have done right. And we're trying to minimize that yeah. kind of regret. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And then and then showing up to like, you know, once just a big part of this is like accepting the level that you're at in that moment. So like, let's say you didn't warm up, you didn't, you know, you didn't sleep well, you haven't been eating well and you show up feeling like shit. Mm -hmm. Can you just accept sooner than as soon as possible that, that's how you feel mm -hmm. that day. And if we're going to be playing, let's just play at the best that this version of ourselves can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's a really powerful point because what I found both in coaching and playing poker is that the set of conditions that's required for optimal performance is actually, it's kind of like getting a lot of dials in exactly the right place. It's about getting into like a very specific frame of mind, I think, for a lot of people. And the slightest mm -hmm. thing being off, like not doing your routine or not exercising where you normally would or just having a bad night's sleep or having some stressor on your mind or whatever can all be enough to just throw something off such that you're just not going to be capable of performing at that level that you'd ideally want to. And then being yeah. able to say, okay, well, this is my B game self and I'm okay with that and I'm going to make the most yeah. out of that and try and learn and you know, try and be profitable anyway and still be productive here, even if it's not as productive as I would have liked to be. That's a really hard thing. I think a lot of people struggle with yeah. the idea that you're given a piece of cake and all the other kids are given a piece of cake and then half of your cake falls off your plate onto the floor at the, the kids' garden yeah. party and all the kids laugh at you and then can you still enjoy that half piece of cake you've got left when everyone else is, you know, having a full slice? And the analogy here is that you would have wanted to have the full slice of cake. That was your expectation the world has decided or your internal conditioning out with your control has decided that you're not going to get that today can you yeah. still make the most of that half bit of cake or are you going to throw the plate on the floor and stamp on it and storm away crying like because a lot of poker players turn their session into a defiant tantrum when they're not performing at the level that they would like to I do that myself yeah yeah i get a good big part of what actually um determines this so even talking about the example of people trying to like fine-tune their circumstances, their internal feelings to be exactly right to maximize performance. I think there's a real misstep in believing that what is allowing them to perform optimally is the way they feel in that moment and all of these things they tune correctly. When in reality, it's the amount of acceptance they have towards those feelings is the biggest 
determining factor. Yep. So when you have, when you fine tuned things and you show up feeling confident, feeling like you worked out, feeling like you ate well, feeling like you slept well, and you're in that, the, the emotional and physiological state that you're in feels very nice. There's a lot of acceptance there. You're very willing to feel that way. And that's the biggest determining thing in, in, in performance. And so even if all of those feelings change, thinking that like that is what changes things like that these feelings mean i can't perform at my best it's actually just how much acceptance can you have for those feelings this is actually the greatest determining variable mm -hmm. in performance in my opinion is how present are you mm -hmm. with what you are feeling with what you are experiencing um there's a lot of research into the science of you know creativity and problem solving that this comes down to but yes yeah, it's really the amount of if i had to put like one quality of experience that determines as well it'd be the amount of ease you're feeling in that moment it's not right. necessarily if you're feeling tired or you're feeling you know you're, you're if you're not feeling cl even clear if you're feeling foggy if you're feeling whatever can you have a sense of ease with those feelings and if you do i find that even though you think you're in your c game or whatever the gap between that and your A game is far less than you thought it was. It's it's it is less, but it's again it's it's much much less than you think it is. What usually makes this massive gap between you not feeling at your best if you will is all of the stories and thoughts and reactions you're having to the way that you're feeling that's creating this distance between you and the game and the moment that you're in. Mm -hmm. And if you can just pause all of that for a moment and just be present with the way that you're feeling um that gap is not as wide as people expect it to be wow that's really that's really cool so the idea is that we're going to be playing a sort of c game on some days but that c game the mistakes we're making there will not be like dramatically terrible usually unless we're like on some kind yeah. of baboon tilt we're probably not going to be as far away from our a game as we as it seems and then I guess what you're saying is the thing that drives you further away, that drives you from C to D to E to F or puts you in a frame of mind where you have no hope of clawing your way towards A is actually all of the the meta stuff, like the judgment about what's going on, the self-depreciation yeah. that happens there. I think it's a really natural thing for a poker player particularly because poker players, as I'm sure you, you're aware, have a, a pretty common trait set i would say i would say that they're extremely they generally score pretty high in things like conscientiousness where they want to get everything right they're yeah. kind of perfectionist they want yeah. to make sure that everything is is neat and tidy and they're performing well at all times and as soon as that feels threatened because they're kind of perfectionists and they're kind of i don't know very competitive people as well usually that don't want to settle for for a b game instead of an a game so as soon as yeah. the cracks start to appear in the foundation, so they realize that there is actually, shall we say, there's there's a comparison going on between what they would have liked to happen and what is currently happening, and the brain is running a program that kind of says this doesn't match up. Yeah. Upon that realization, I think it's the natural reaction for many, many poker players to then go, therefore, I have failed, therefore, I'm not good enough. Yeah. I'm now going to create this sort of kind of, training dummy punch bag version of myself and beat the shit out of it it's almost like they're you yeah. can see the, the soul being sucked out of them and they just start punching the shit out of this thing i'm playing yeah. this game right now called them um yeah lords of the fallen where you can actually suck yeah. the soul out of an enemy and then beat the shit out of it and i feel like that's so analogous to what poker players do to themselves at the table they almost yeah. create this version of themselves that they can take all of their anger out on and once you start treating yourself like shit you just you stop valuing yourself and you you start to see yourself as some kind of victim you feel victimized and it's a vicious mm. cycle so what would you say to people um someone said earlier actually i'd just like to walk away from a session not despising myself a paraphrase it was something like that what would yeah. you say to someone who, who scores so highly in all of these personality traits that make them uber competitive and conscientious and focused and want the best what would you say to them to, to actually disarm that kind of bullying parental you are not good enough side of themselves that comes out very readily upon the perception of a, mm. a mismatch between expectations and reality. Mm. Yeah, this is a big question. Um, one thing I would say is that there's, there's nothing you can really 
say to a person who's got this deep habit pattern built in of sort of beating themselves up? I mean, the main, the main thing that's coming to mind right now, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot here that I could say, but the main thing that's coming to mind right now is one of the big things I want to work with my students on in any domain, because I work with people outside of poker is recognizing that our lives aren't segmented, mm -hmm. that our life is one thing. And the, the currency that we're always playing in that we can often forget we're playing in is well-being. And that it's easy when you start playing, when you start, when you put your mind in a category of like, okay, I'm playing poker. Mm. Now the currency that matters to me is money or status or, or succeeding at this thing. And when I fail to do that thing, then I can excuse whatever comes after that, that I believe might make me do better at that. I, ironically, it won't even do that. But the biggest thing that is important for me to like, initially start showing people is that what the the thing that you always care about is how happy you are like whether or not you realize it the the currency that matters the most to you always is your well-being and so the question is can we engage with everything we do wholesomely in our entire life through this lens of this is my life and poker is a part of it and then start asking ourselves, how do I want to live my life and include poker in that? Not how do I want to play poker and what parts of myself or my well being, my happiness, my contentment do I want to sacrifice in order to succeed at poker? Mm -hmm. And I think that switch is really powerful for people because then when you, when something goes poorly, whatever thoughts come into your mind, which are natural, whatever kind of self judgment, viewing instead of viewing this through the lens of how useful is this for me to be a better poker player which might be easy to defend even though i don't think it's true it is useful um mm -hmm. it's much more easy to recognize wow this is really making me miserable um and and i don't want to be miserable regardless of whatever thing is happening i want to find a way to succeed and not be miserable and if i can't do that then maybe and then i've done i've worked with people who have decided like i'm not i'm not going to play poker anymore because i don't know how to play this game and be happy and i want to be happy and i think that's a really important shift uh for people to do mm -hmm. is to recognize that like your your well-being should come first and more importantly there is this recognition also that is just coincidentally true we're fortunate that that's the case that the happier you are the better you will perform at anything you want to do. Right. Like that just happens to be the case. Um, but I, I, I want to shift this priority though, because it, if you, if it's, if happiness is so that you do better, um, that clenching, that tensing that goes into game, part of the reason performance is so hard in game is the stakes are so high for us personally. Mm -hmm. Right. So like when, if you're a poker player, you go into the game and it's not just because you want to do well, you believe doing well means you will get status, you'll get acceptance, you'll get financial freedom, you'll get all of this. And so when you're, when the stakes on these decisions is so high, your brain can sense it. Your brain can, that your brain can know that, okay, this, these decisions to us, we believe they really matter in terms of our ability to, to succeed in life and all the things that we want to protect ourselves, to be safe, to be loved, to be all of these things. And when the stakes are that high, uh, your brain, I can get into the neuroscience of this, but your brain basically starts shutting down the prop, like the creative problem solving part of yourself yep. and just goes into survival mode and just goes into how can we make this thing simplest as possible? How can we reduce them and like not take in complexity and how can we just basically go into fight or flight mode? And so starting with you, starting with self-compassion, self-care, immediately lowers the stakes when you show up to play when when you care about yourself and you know your well-being is not determined on the outcome of this playing session the stakes immediately go so much lower and you can just real again bring that ease into game much more naturally yeah it's it really resonates with my own experiences as well because i know for a fact that when i'm playing what i consider to be my a game I'm kind of like a toddler in a playpen. I feel like I'm safe. Yeah. I'm not hungry. I'm not tired. I'm not angry. I'm not threatened by predators. It's 
I'm yeah. in a cozy environment and I'm I'm at one with myself. I feel like I'm relaxed enough to be able to take in everything. So like noticing yeah. details is a huge part of poker, being like, oh, there's this part of yeah. the guy's range that I actually forgot existed because I was so tunneled in on the my limbic system yeah. had kicked in and I was so tunneled in on the fight yep. or flight of it that I could only see this part of the range yeah. or that part of the range. So there's a real um broadening of the percept the yeah. field of perception at the point where we relax. Um it's a book called Malcolm Gladwell called Blink and it's about he describes it as a temporary autism or his words that the human mind yeah. goes into this kind of tunnel vision. I'm only going to look at the factors that are directly relevant to my survival right now. And it's he posits that it explains like lots of instances where police officers shoot the wrong person and things shoot innocent people because yeah. they're they're highly in in the fight or flight state and then something moves and they shoot and it's like why did you shoot that old woman that like walked past and it's like because yeah. they were so dialed into if there is movement you shoot so that you don't die or something like yeah. that and that's obviously an extreme example yeah. but yeah, you but feel yeah. that yourself when you're in a poker session right you feel that when the pot yeah. gets really big there's a part of your brain that's trying to suck you into a uh, I call it type two thinking, like in like in our mental game kind yeah. of discussions yeah. that we've had in the podcast, we we talk about like type one, type two, and type three thinking. And type one is intuition. It's kind of like when your brain is good at something and it's relaxed and it knows what's going on. It's it's fluid, right? The decisions come to you easily. The hand reading yeah. comes to you easily, and you can see what's happening. Yeah. That's that's mode one. Mode two, we talk about as um coercive desire based fight or flight survivally stuff. So like, I need to win this pot so that I don't feel like I've been bested by another. By another male in the hierarchy it could be for me or it could yeah. be just like I'm, so i don't feel my resources are taken from me it could have an evolutionary yeah. interpretation as simple and as british as that and then type three thinking is more like your explicit deliberation that you do when you're actually logicking yeah. something out in the conscious domain and the idea is that the less type two thinking is in there and the more type one specifically but also a bit of type three too much type three kills your yeah. thought process too but you want mostly type yeah. one with a smattering of type three like the salt on top of the the fries um that yeah. works really well and i find that as type 2 thinking invades it happens more and more when you become more and more stressed and when the stakes start to feel high so i guess the question is like if the toddler in the playpen that's like satiated and not in danger um is the holy grail that's like the thing we're aiming towards as a poker player is yeah. that like free explorative child kind of curious mentality i've always said curiosity and tilt are like completely incompatible if you're curious yeah. you can't be tilted and vice versa how do Agreed. we get to that state of mind? Like, what's your first steps for someone who says, I'm very mm -hmm. rarely in that curious, explorative kind of mindset. I know yeah. I need to be, but I just don't know how to unlock that. It takes almost nothing to throw me into a, a myopic fight or flight kind of condition. Yeah. Yeah. So the work that I do basically centers around three different areas. Um, and it's really gonna, it's really gonna depend on the person. Um, what where sort of where we begin if you will um because i kind of work with three different areas i did i did, did you know break them down as practice as life and as um concepts ideas so practice being like the sort of skill that we can practice in being present like um i'm a big i have a fairly robust background in meditation I, i'm a big proponent of it i think Meditation is a great way to practice being present. There's other ways too, but there's the sort of skill of practicing just being here, uh, which is a big part of being curious and like the skill of actually opening to what's happening. Mm -hmm. For some people though, uh, what they show up to be present to is, is too painful. Like they're experiencing too much negative emotions that, and they're not skilled enough in being present that the moment they try to be present with what's happening, they're immediately thrown into reactivity mm -hmm. and they just can't do it. So for those people, we'll either look at their lifestyle because mm -hmm. again, your life isn't segmented. So it's a matter of how are your relationships? That's a big thing. Um, how your relationships are a big thing that factor into how safe and secure and supported you feel in life. Um, how is your, you know, sleep, diet, exercise, things like this. Uh, the better you feel about all of these, the more likely, the more supportive it is to be present because the better you feel in each moment, the better you feel in each moment, the less skill it takes to be present. Um, that's why when presence shows up is when we're like sort of feel tuned in. It's very easy to be present because we love that feeling. Um, and so 
So that's lifestyle. So it depends on if someone, if somebody, if we, if we, you know, talk with somebody who's just lifestyle is terrible. Um, and, and there's, it's really about alignment though. If someone's lifestyle is what I would judge as terrible, but they judge as great, then that's fine. I'm not gonna, I'm not one to like tell you how to live your life. But like, if someone's like, Hey, I'm really not sleeping well, I would like to sleep better. And I just don't know how we would start some, maybe we might start some more with that. And then the third is sort of concepts and ideas. And this is probably where the, the, what most people think of when they think of mental game coaching. And this is sort of like the act of reframing the way that we conceptualize the world, experience the moments. Um, I had a really good teacher who told me once that all thinking is wishful thinking. And that's, I think it's a really important idea that the way we, the motivations and the views that we bring to each moment are going to color everything we think about and everything that we see and what we think is happening. Um, and so for that can be the easiest for some people, the easiest place to start doing some heavy lifting of just like, Hey, you view yourself this way. You view life this way. You view things this way. And it, it takes like, it, it, you know, it, it takes talking to people and seeing what are the views, the viewpoints, the beliefs that they have that is really hurting them and limiting them and starting to like sort of take those apart. Um, but, but that, that can be really, it's, it's slippery because one of the big problems I believe poker players have is that we, we miscategorize thinking for experience all the time. And so we miscategorize the concepts and the ideas we have about what's happening to what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when you start working with people, sometimes you have to start with just their ideas and their concepts of the world. But it's really important to flag that, hey, we're doing reframing. Your ability to conceptualize something is not your ab ability to experience it directly. Mm -hmm. That is not the same. And we're, where we want to get you is experiencing each moment, relaxing your your inclination to um, to uh, think and to, and to uh, yeah, like uh, conceptualize reality. So... So yeah, so depending on the person, we'll start depend uh, on those few areas. Usually, some combined approach. Usually, because they all kind of apply. So I might start working with people on the skill of being present. How do we? Uh, I break presence into three different areas, which is effort, attention, and mindfulness. And then um, I break basically the way we approach lifestyle things is through our systems, our goals and ambitions, and our time management. And then concepts breaks down into. Um, knowledge and our beliefs those two areas so that's kind of like my eight areas that i kind of work with people on and depending on who you are it's very highly variable depending on where we need to start with that but whoever you are it's probably what some of those things that need to be worked on <laughs> yeah 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 it's interesting the the point about experience and conceptualization just being completely different like this i get this a yeah. lot it's more of a technical point but I get this a lot with people who joined the discord having done um say grade one of the character poker skill it's a three grade thing there's like 30 lectures it's many many hours long and it's quite quite a deep course and it's a theory course which means that it's showing you how poker works in the objective and in the abstract yeah. and when you've not played a lot of poker but you've become acquainted with concepts like range advantage and whose range cards are better for and which textures yeah. you should go small on and which ones you should go bigger on and ideas like that and then you play a hand of poker and you post all of this stuff and you post all of this jargon like someone this morning posted in my channel with like oh this is a range advantage nut advantage spot and it's a still lake texture and it's a strip of barrel opportunity with no showdown value so i decided to bluff him along these lines and as i was giving my feedback i just found that like every street i was kind of like saying well you're listing lots of conceptualizations about the spot and that's fine yeah. but what about the question of which line is higher EV or which sizing is better or what the opponent's range actually yeah. is. And until you've been immersed in experiencing those things, you're really going to struggle to engage in a mode one sense. Like you might be able to like clumsily yeah. sort of bumble your way around with mode three thinking and occasionally you'll hit upon something that happens to be relevant and direct enough to lead you to the right answer. But the problem with mode three thinking, which is the explicit conscious thought, is that there's just too much that you could think right and until your mode one is really skilled at like filtering it down and finding the right thought or finding not even a thought sometimes it's just a, a feeling or just like i feel yeah. this is right until you get into that game flow um so so different so yeah i do feel that like people cramming tons of knowledge quote unquote knowledge into their brain but yeah. not actually experiencing poker in an engaged present enough way 
hurts their development, yeah. right? Would you agree that like if I play poker yeah. without being engaged with like lots of meta thoughts and self judgment going on, and my focus is elsewhere, I'm not truly really present in any of the ways that you've described. I'm not mindful. I'm not attentive. Um, yeah, and that would lead me to not really be able to learn from what I'm doing, right? Because we learn through that immersion and that curiosity as well. So you yeah. could actually take this a step further and say, not yeah. only is it bad for my EV and my win rate and my performance if I'm not present, but also I'm not growing in the way that humans are meant to grow. We are learning by picking up object, feeling object, smelling object, putting it in my mouth, spitting it out again, that sort of thing. That's how we learn. We've done this for yeah. you know millions of years. So if we're in some kind of fight or flight mode, we're in some kind of survival is threatened mode, we can't learn anything, right? Because it's the focus has shifted away. And I think that's just so often the case with everything in life, but especially for poker, because the gambling aspect and the risk aspect so quickly and readily, you can say, triggers that that retreat into the limbic system. So it's I think I think presence is something that I really struggle with when I'm streaming. And as I've been playing a bit more off stream and I've been making these videos where I play a session, I record it and I go over some hands from it later. I found that's me playing my A game. And then when I try and stream, because I'm looking at chat and I'm doing all these other things, I get sucked right out of that presence and I yeah. just can't be present anymore. And it's an absolute mm -hmm. night and day, you know, A game and D game, basically like night and day. So yeah. I guess for people who are find themselves distracted, can you just build the muscle of presence is it something that like yeah. you build it like you would at the gym through mindfulness practice yeah. and stuff like that yeah just reps yeah yeah reps are important i mean there's this for you know let's take your example of just of talking about streaming um when you're streaming and you know there's there's chat and there's things going on i think likely the the enemy of presence is reactivity right so it's 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 just reactiveness so like the you can just bring curiosity as you were saying mm. to that experience itself and just say instead of taking it as just sort of a given that like okay i'm just gonna be i'm just gonna be less present mm. when i'm streaming it's more what is reducing my presence while streaming and can i open to that it's imagine that open to so that safe experience? generally let's do it yeah, yeah, I'd imagine that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's the thing, right? So it's, it's it's that. Like, do I do I feel do I feel you know uh, Im, you know implicit eyes on me, and that you know that feeling is unpleasant, and mm -hmm. and I'm feeling this pressure to perform well, and that feeling is unpleasant. And usually, what reduces our ability to play is because there's something in our experience arising that we want to fix, we want to get rid of it. Yeah. And we believe if I behave in X way, it will change that feeling. Yeah. And that's that's what I mean. It's the opposite of presence. It's reactivity. There's there's if you want to get real specific, there's a a somatic experience. And then there is a feeling tone of negativity, of positivity, of neutrality, then that arises at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then that feeling tone creates a preference of I like this, I don't like this. Let me get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And so in being present, it's more just, can we just bring some curiosity to that whole process, prospect, uh, process, that whole thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. And can we just open to the, the whole of it? Can we just say like, okay, I'm playing. And can we sort of take our, we can intentionally learn to practice widening the aperture of our awareness. And you can tell that you're reacting to something. So there's this other quote from this um, teacher that I really appreciate. There's, there's two, there's two quotes here that I'll reference, but Aja Samedo, who is a, meditation teacher um used to say that which we do not see we become so it's when when there's an experience you're reacting to when there's like some some pressure or something and you're and you're in averting your attention from it you're just like a, you're 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 trying to focus more on the game or these things that you actually believe are fixes to this feeling mm -hmm. what you don't see you become so in that moment you are you're becoming this pressure and that is driving all of your experience in that moment and and so the it's, it's bringing that curiosity in. And so there's this other quote that I really like, which is uh, from Carl Jung. So we'll come at it from, you know, an esoteric perspective and a more Western scientific perspective. But mm. Carl Jung said, um, if you fail to make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. And so it's the same idea. So whenever there's, yeah, you can definitely learn uh, to expand this presence, but the, the best indicator of, hey, let me be curious in this moment. 
is that feeling of tension. That's why I use effort as such an important thing is that feeling of tension, that feeling of efforting, that feeling of like, I need to be dialing in here. And almost certainly when you're talking about firing up the stream and your B gate coming on, there's a distinct feeling of efforting. I would wager yep. is arising at that moment, right? There's a distinct feeling of like, I need to be efforting. I need to be doing, I need to be doing something here. Performing, like the doing yeah. is the, mm -hmm. yeah, performing, right? And so then if we can just take that instead of buying into it of, okay, let me now just do that. Let me, let me just, let me just perform. But instead say like, oh, what is this in reaction to? What, what is here? Like, can I just widen my aperture and just like open a little bit? And I think you'll find the more you do that, the more you have space for everything. No, nothing can dilute your presence. Like you, your awareness is like infinite. Like you can just widen it up. You can have it all. And, and then you can just perform how you always would. Yeah. So by that, that quote about what is, what was it again about what is unseen? What we, what we do not see, we become, we become. Yeah. So it's almost like if you avert your gaze to a blip of the perceived threat through like a red dot on your radar, I'm imagining like an air traffic yeah. controller seeing like a, a red dot coming across the screen. And if you just yeah. say, well, I'm going to not consciously acknowledge that that won't go away. Like you still know that's there. It's like, if you have a job to do, like, say you have to like fill in a form for your accountant or something like that, you don't do it. Yeah. And you go through your day, you're exponentially more stressed out throughout that day. The thought keeps arising. You keep having to like, just forget it. Your subconscious tries to press it down, but it really eats away at you. And it's almost like what, what you're saying is that if something comes up that is raised in our radar as like some kind of blip or threat that we we need to process if we refuse to actually look at that and process that then it just gnaws away as actually just sucks us in and then we become it so yeah that i'm just imagining like this vortex that just gradually sucks yeah. us in like a black hole and we just we, well it's... we have to become subconsciously what we've not actually you know by it's almost by seeing it and consciously processing it we assure our subconscious that we don't have to become it and we don't have to just like you know obey it's every whim basically yeah. Yeah. I mean, it comes down to also like this view of what thought is, right? I think mm. this is very important that people believe thought is in some sense, primarily us. Mm -hmm. Like many people believe like I am my thoughts like that. I identify most with my thoughts, but your thoughts are secondary by every means of like every way we can look at it biologically, neurologically, whatever your thoughts are a means of, of conceptualizing your experience into some perceived way of acting. Yep. And so when you're caught up thinking about how you're going to behave, you are always reacting to something. You are always reacting. So that's why I said like, like uh, all thinking is wishful thinking. Mm. There, there's no way of getting around your motivation and getting around your view in that moment. So the moment you're, you're planning your actions, you're trying to perform, if there is an experience you're having that you don't like and you're not looking at it you're you're now thinking through that lens you're now through the lens of that feeling mm. is now and it's going to color every thought every intention every action that you have and it's only by what when you willingly open to it your motivation has changed your intention has changed right now now your motivation to be present is is there your your motivation to be open to experience to be there with all that you are to be non-judgmental towards what's happening is there and now that colors every thought every action every intention and so once you understand that you, you can't just think objectively that's just not that's just not a thing like you you just can't do it you can't you can't just look out into the world and just uh, there's no way to just objectively uh sort of evaluate the world then you know you you take your motivations and your your feelings very seriously like your awareness of them mm -hmm. because yeah because you, you can't just um you can't just tell yourself you're doing something and then and then it becomes so you know like yeah, yeah, yeah. and so you can't, they, you can't they, manifest they, truth through your own beliefs like these days exactly, a lot of yeah. people are very sucked into this culture yeah. of like self-determining sort of hedonism where they say well i feel a certain way i think a certain way mm. therefore this is the expression that makes me want to like literally like punch someone as my truth yeah. like this expression because what they're yeah. basically saying yeah. is like i had a thought therefore the thought is true and valid it's almost like anything i think is now objective fact and that is an extremely mm -hmm. like dangerous thing for like culturally yeah. and for the world but it's also just as you said 
plainly false because there are many thoughts we have that are just i guess if you were a type identity theorist and philosophy minded you believe that like the the mind was identical with the brain and every thought had like a chemical i i'm not i don't actually think this is this is true i think there's a lot yeah. of problems with this theory but if you did think that every thought had a certain biological brain state that it was type identical or even token identical with then you would end up like having brain states that resulted in thoughts that were just a certain arrangement of chemicals or or biology and some of them they that doesn't have to be true there's nothing in that that makes us think that that thought there therefore has to be yeah. true right you can have a thought like yeah. that's complete bullshit like sometimes i think something and then like two seconds later i'm like oh my god i can't believe i was just thinking that so our thoughts are kind of however whatever your philosophy of mind is like whether you think the mind is yeah. you're a dualist and you think the mind is totally separate to the body and you believe in a soul or whether you believe that it's simply people are just their brains or whether you believe that there's some other divine realm or whether you believe we're living in a simulation whatever it is everything that happens in your mind happens objectively and independently to in some sense to like your body and the outside world so there's these three layers yeah. it's like the biology your body you as the animal there's the outside world which is your habitat and environment and then there's your thoughts which are like your attempts to kind of hack away at that and integrate the two and make sense of it and i think our thoughts are very often us trying to piece things together and trying to build a map of meaning as jordan peterson might say like we're trying to map things to the world and to ourselves in a way that makes us more successful in that environment and a lot of those are misfiring a lot of those are like just wrong yeah. and so we need to be able to say i had a thought but that doesn't mean anything that th there's no therefore we need to get rid of that ergo yeah. like i had a thought therefore i'm going to do this or therefore this is true i think there's a tacit implicit assumption that we make sometimes that because we think something we must now behave exactly as if that thing is true and that's us getting sucked right into that thought and the meaning behind it yeah well i mean you can get down i don't know how interesting they'll be to anybody i don't know how interesting any of this is to anybody listening but i mean like if you if you want to get down to like I have this conversation with students all the time because I find the discussion is useful to like sort of pick apart what people like, what is a thought? Like, why do we think like evolutionarily, why do we think? And like a lot of people struggle to sort of answer this um, in a way that like can, can make sense of what thought is. And what a lot of people don't realize is that everything we've evolved, everything, it has to be related to movement in one way or another. If we didn't evolve it to help us move, if it didn't help us get food or, or not be food, then there was no reason to have it, right? So what this means is that our thoughts are deeply related to the experience in your body. Like your mm -hmm. body is promoting most of your thoughts. Your, your feelings are about monitoring your interoception. So like your, your, your heart rate, your metabolism, like things like this, like it's all about how am I going to act in the next moment is really what all your thoughts are about is like, what am I going to do next? They're very little. We believe because our thoughts have allowed us to do so many powerful things mm -hmm. that our thoughts are our brain's way of understanding the world, but it's not. So explicit thought, like that's why the language center of your brain is in your almost entirely in your left hemisphere and your left hemisphere is heavily reliant on um, explicit conceptual reasoning, explicit conceptual representations, because your left hemisphere is what we use to act on the world. It's no, it's your experientially, it's no, it's no coincidence that you said a lot of system one in your words with some system three is kind of the way we want to be. Mm -hmm. That's not a coincidence because intuition, creativity, intuition, the, the sort of non-conceptual mode of being is very right hemispheric. Mm -hmm. um, great book on this is The Master and His Emissary for those interested. Um, but our brains are really break down along, along conceptual, non-conceptual experiential lines. And so the but what's interesting about this is your left hemisphere gets almost no data from your right but your right hemisphere gets all the data from the left so if you're in this sort of explicit left hemispheric way of thinking you are getting basically no data from your right hemisphere mm -hmm. but if you're in this non-conceptual open present creative headspace you're still getting all the data from your left the information sharing across mm -hmm. your hemispheres is so very one is very one way 
Mm -hmm. And so when people collapse around concepts as what is reality, that's where you see this complete struggling to like understand the situation they're in. It's like their game because gets worse and worse the more they do that. Right? Yeah. And it's important in the beginning, right? Like when you're learning anything new, it's more explicit, it's more conceptual. But as you gain experience, it's really important. There's a really good book also called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Mm -hmm. And and it's really about how to like let go of adapt of strategies you've adapted once they've outlived their usefulness. And this is a very important part of growth is there's a there can be really important things that get you to a certain point and then you just have to kill them and and never look back. And and that could be that's a really hard process. But but yeah, I mean, once you understand that thought is for action, it's not for comprehension. Mm -hmm. But you're 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 the left hemisphere is for apprehending the world. Your right hemisphere is for comprehending the world. And once you know that, when you're trying to understand what's happening, you have to let go of this knee-jerk reaction to think about it. Mm -hmm. Because all your thoughts are about doing something. And we have to learn to do less, like just be. And that that is like a really big key of performance in my experience. Yeah, so it's like we're always going to have the mode three, like as long as we're not going into like, as long as we don't shut the door, like we can shut the door very easily on the mode one stuff if we're not careful. But once we've allowed the mode one to to function yeah. freely, the mode three will still be readily accessible yeah. to us, right? And that's, yeah. the, that's the powerful yeah. thing. Whereas if we do it the other way around and we focus yeah. heavily on mode three, we literally just put up the mesh and the mode one thoughts can't get in any, or not thoughts is the wrong, the impressions, yeah. interpretations can't get in anymore. And then we become yeah. like basically blind, blinded by logic, blinded by thought. Yeah. That's yeah. And so you see this across the political, you see this across so many landscapes right now where w the Western world is just heavily conceptual. And so you mm. see this, this, the left hemisphere tendencies, there's reasons for this, but like the left hemisphere is very arrogant. It's very certain. It, 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 the way you could think about it is it's preserve the model at all costs. That's how mm -hmm. the left hemisphere thinks because it's about survival. It's about like, again, like, quick decisions, simplifying the world, reducing it down, and then preserving our model at all costs. So it rejects anomalies. Anything that um, conflicts with our model, we throw out, we ignore. And so it would make sense that that part of our brain would completely reject everything else. Yeah. But the right hemisphere is kind of the inverse. It's very fascinated by anomalies and, and it wants to make sense of them. It wants to be like, why is this anomaly showing up and how do I take all of the information that my my sort of more conceptual explicit brain is giving me and make it fit within and it's very curious and adaptive and mm -hmm. um it's a huge part of the creative process and that's why a, a lot of what i work with specifically i mean almost everybody on regardless of what they're doing on is how can we become just more creative people how can yep. we just be finding more creative solutions and more situations and not just in poker, but in our lives and our relationships and our yep. just everything. Can we just open and be more creative as people? Yeah, I don't know if you agree with this, but I think with the advent of like technology and the internet, we've moved even more towards that left brain stuff towards like everything being typed out, like being put into words, communication mm, yeah. by chat, having to use like internal logic to navigate your way around the internet to do things to like spend your time yeah. like i want to send an email to someone and express something but i can't just say what i'm thinking i have to like click an icon and log into a client and then write yeah. something in the about field and it really mechanizes absolutely everything right and i think as i've got older yeah. and as technology has advanced with me getting older i find immersion and i don't think i'm alone in this i find achieving a state of immersion or curiosity or playfulness incredibly difficult like i used to play computer games for like six hours straight and i'd be so immersed in them that the outside yeah. world could just fuck off as far as i was concerned like it needn't even exist yeah. because this was the world that i built and i called it internal time when i was like young and i was like writing shit and i i, I like tried to differentiate between internal time and external time and internal time to me was when mm. i could get so lost and immersed in some kind of activity or thing or whatever it could be it could be a book it could be a game it could be just anything i was doing um it could be like playing a musical instrument that I was just at one with that thing and that became the universe temporarily. And as I've got older, I don't yeah. know if chat would agree with this. 
I just think that is so incredibly hard to achieve because we're so conditioned to just go straight back into thinking, typing, processing left brain stuff all the time. Yeah. And I think that's one reason why I used to find it easier to feel like I was good at poker because I'd just be in the zone. I just, I still yeah. had the ability to access that right brain explorative, just being one with yeah. the game. And then the more I made content, the more I created concepts and that helped a ton of new players get into the game, but it didn't do me much of a service because I was at the point that you described where I no longer had to rely on those concepts i wanted to now shed them at least in their explicit form right so that i could actually get yeah. back in touch with all of the right brain stuff yeah. and then i was I, I found that shedding much harder because i'd interwoven my brain to just like link it to a concept so coaching and coaching theor theoretical poker and creating theoretical content specifically made it way harder for me to be in touch with all of that that side of the game that yeah. is just so so important it's just like knowing yeah. what is actually happening in poker so with that maybe we can now pivot to more yeah. poker related questions looking through chat a bit and inviting a few people on to actually express yeah. some of their performance related mental game anything you want yeah. really um less technical stuff today but anything sort of to do with tilt mental game performance related stuff so in order to come on and chat with us just um message me on twitch just send me a, a dm there just now and say that you want on and i will send you a zoom link and you can jump on a call with us you don't need to have a webcam you can just ask some questions but in the meantime how about we just address some chat while we're waiting for some volunteers to come on the show yeah, if anyone, yeah, feel free to hop on with any of your questions. I'd love to love to talk and get into some things and obviously chat questions always welcome. Yep. Matthew, thank you very much. I'm glad you're enjoying it. And shout out to Carl Malija, who's one of your students or someone you've worked with, Jared. Andriana? A former student. Former right. students. Um, because I don't do poker coaching anymore, but Makes sense. uh getting former student, good friend. Andriana. Cool. Welcome to Adriana as yeah. well. Um, can you define the mode one through mode three thinking, please, as Monkey May I? Yeah. Um, so mode one thinking is kind of, maybe we've already done this since you asked, but just real quick, mode one thinking is the intuitive stuff. It's the stuff that comes to you when the filter gate is up and your brain is open to it. I guess it's the more right brain stuff. It's kind of knowing that your opponent's range is weighted in a certain direction or having a feel that a play is best. And that's not just hocus pocus, you know, there's nothing spiritual that I, I'm not a spiritual person. I don't want to posit anything, you know, supernatural to explain anything like that i would yeah. just say that it's experience it's just the, the mind being very good at like knowing what's happening through a subconscious recognition and um, type two yeah. is you could say tilt but it's not synonymous for tilt i think tilt's a weird word that we could get into jared like exactly what people mean by tilt i think different people mean different things but mode yeah. two is kind of based on it could be based on the limbic system fight and flight it could be based on survival it could be based on desiring or fearing a certain state of affairs in the future and it's to do with action it's about trying to run away or run towards a certain state of affairs or a certain future feeling that you do or don't want to experience um type three thinking is very conscious slow processing it's logical it, it operates in a very i guess i'd say finite domain like the processing power of the the conscious mind is like two bit atari or something or amiga and then like the subconscious mind feels to me like a supercomputer and uh, by comparison i think it's kind of night and day so that's the three types yeah. of of way that we describe the psyche as it relates to poker um yeah yeah and so i would break the yeah, i mean if i were to put this into my own terminology mm. um i would put explicit reasoning into into three and i actually think there's a fair amount of um, overlap actually between what you're calling system two and system three. I think it's, mm. um, I think it's, it's one is just one is system three under significant duress is, is really right, right, system right. two is really just system three under a lot of duress. Um, and then, and then, but then system one is, yeah, this more implicit, I wouldn't even call it necessarily subconscious. Like it's it's subconscious until it isn't, right? I think you can. I think a lot of what people believe is subconscious, um, they're just not used to paying attention to. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a skill you can grow to increase your ability to like receive the information that your body is trying to communicate to you. Um, but yeah, it'd be more. It'd be more implicit. It'd be less like less explicit, less less categorical. And so that that's really the domain of. Uh, just feelings like what yeah that's why like it, what what things feel like um because there's so much data contained with it there's this uh ian mcgillicris used this really useful term called the limit case mm -hmm. he calls it a limit case which is like what is which is the a symbol of something 
that is the most stripped down version of it mm -hmm. that still represents the original thing in some way. So like everything explicit is like the limit case of something implicit. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have a concept for something, like if I say a tree, mm -hmm. if I think of a tree, I'm not thinking of any particular tree. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of some categorical average, but that is unbelievably reduced from complexity from any actual tree, right? And so any concept is really just the limit case. It's like something very stripped down mm -hmm. and like the most reduced version of that thing. And that is why when we get into what you're calling system two, mm -hmm. we're really just in system three dialed up to a million. And so like we're now thinking in unbelievably stripped down representations of the world. And that makes it very difficult to make um, good decisions. Interesting. So what, what you're kind of saying is that system three kicks in first, but it goes into such a hyperdrive that it almost feels so out of our control. Like we have so little control over those thoughts that it maybe feels more subconscious in the way that system one is, but there's an extremely massive gulf between system one and system two, but not actually much of a gulf between system two and system three in their true nature. Yeah, um, kind of. So like, I, yeah, I think that's a fairly good description. What I would add to it is that the nature of system three, its mm. tendency is to take its representations for reality. And the, the more explicitly using that system we are, the more we forget that these concepts aren't reality. And then when we're under stress, mm. we're building very stripped down representations of the world and taking them to be real, taking them to be the actual situation we're in. Mm -hmm. And so once you start feeling like someone, for example, has it out for you, your ability to investigate that feeling for reality goes out the window. Yep. And now it is just framing your whole experience in that moment. Yep. And that is what's real. And so, yeah, so that's, um, I would say that's, that's the big distinction is that we're, in, if we're just lightly in system three and the way that you're describing it, we always have this, the, the reason the book is called the master and his emissary is because there's the master and his emissary who he sends to do work. Mm -hmm. And the emissary gets somewhere and forgets he's not the master. And that's the left hemisphere in the way that he describes it. Mm -hmm. And so in this, and the, the, you can imagine that if we still are dealing in sort of system one, as you describe it, mm -hmm. we, re we retain this ability to be curious and investigative of the concepts we build yep. as real. Yep. But as we shift into system three, and this is usually under sympathetic nervous system arousal, yep. as we start getting stressed and anxious, yep. we start losing that ability. And we start now taking our concepts as real and our concepts start becoming more and more adversarial, more and more me versus them, more and more zero sum, mm -hmm. more and more, um, yeah, more and more arrogance, more and more closed minded, more and more. And this is all just, again, to facilitate quick decision making under stress, but most situations that we're in and, and life or death ones, like we just need a simple world to deal with. That's like not so cognitively intensive, yeah. but in modern life, that is rarely the situation we're actually in. Um, yeah. So there's a real paradox here. Like it's like system three over complicates things semantically, but dumbs things down conceptually. You could also almost say like we add more concepts and we add more semantics to what we're doing, but we actually like with the example of the tree, we're actually ruining yeah. or like degrading the the yep. texture and the the resolution of what's actually there whereas our subconscious processor system one can take all of that yeah. in fully and, and spit out yep. a very accurate um verdict which is why i think when i'm playing and i feel like i'm really nailing things it is like i'm just sifting a bit of sand from system three my system yeah. one feels like this omniscient overseer that's just like i know what's going on but let me just take a little scoop of that stuff there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i know what that is now let me do this whereas when system three takes over it's like must simplify game to only range check and just like weird like when concept yeah. trumps reality when like you yeah. lose sight of what you're even trying to do because of concepts and i was talking about this in a video this morning it always bugs me when poker players are like I am going to play a strategy where I only X in Y spot. And it's like, but you haven't even engaged with like what's going on, what's your opponent got, yeah. what's best against what they're actually doing. And it's, it's so easy done, isn't it? Yeah, right, the way I describe you... it, I, 
Sorry, Jared, I want to get to these say, questions. Yeah, you get yeah. to that. Go ahead and finish what you're about to say. Then I'm going to pop off yeah. and speak to my girlfriend for one second and let her know that I've left yeah. the chickens out and it's getting dark. So, you know, we need to maybe she well, needs to go and yeah, see. I was just going to say to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So to what you were saying, though, mm. I think a good analogy here is uh, there's there's good problems about like what are called insight problems. Mm -hmm. There's sort of like linear processing problems. And, there, and then there's what poker is and what other problems are that are insight problems mm -hmm. that are parallel processing problems. They're not sequential processors. We need to process information in parallel to get to a good in, uh, mm -hmm. answer. And a good way of thinking about this is if you, the experience of like the tip of the tongue phenomenon, let's say you're trying to think of an actor yep. and you can't think of that person, the more you tense around trying to think of it, the harder it's going to yep. be. 100%. If you can sort of lightly drop in some prompts for yourself in your mind of things you know it's related to, but like mm. not be tense, then that thing might be spurred to you. Yep. That's a similar men mental space of playing poker where you kind of want to be processing everything in parallel and kind of like you said, like sifting your hand through sand, mm -hmm. just dropping in prompts of like, is this relevant? But, and th even then though, the prompts that are being suggested to you are likely coming from your more intuitive side of like these questions feel relevant here. Yep. Um, and having some reduced processes probably uh, isn't super useful, but go ahead and I'll answer some of these questions. Yeah, cool. Okay, give me one sec. Yeah. So poker is zero-sum game. So this is, I actually recently posted um, on Twitter about this, um, that poker is a zero-sum game if you let it be. Uh, you're playing in one domain. It's zero-sum in the domain of, of, of money. But if you can open up to other potential types of reward in the experience of playing poker, let's take just like the joy of playing a game. This is a non-zero-sum game. Everybody playing can enjoy the game fully. And if you can look at it through the lens of trying to improve yourself and the way that you think and grow in a game and like everybody can be doing that. And when you collapse around zero sumness, um, this is a very averse way of thinking and it's a very non-creative headspace for you to be in. So coincidentally, the more you connect with the non-zero sumness of the game of poker, the better you will perform at the zero sum part of poker, if that makes sense. Um, I know Maxi Sweetie's having overcoming tunnel vision. It's a bit of a leak of mine sometimes in relation to my own actions rather than villain's range. Yeah. So tunnel vision is um tunnel vision is tough. The best thing you can do when experiencing tunnel vision is to to first to notice that that's what's happening, right? So sometimes it can be even helpful to like tell yourself, I feel very tunnel visioned right now. But Usually I would argue that there's probably some other feeling you're experiencing um, that is causing this and to learn to sort of investigate what is the thing I'm reacting to in my experience right now? What's the thing I'm trying to change? And my tunnel vision is usually a, an, a product of having a very specific thing in my experience I'm wanting to change and therefore looking for a very specific solution. Um, and I would say to look for the cause, not to just go to fixing tunnel vision, because then that just becomes the next thing we're tunnel visioned on is fixing tunnel vision, right? So the more we can just like open to experience fully in the moment, the better. Um, a big thing that I want to say, which I don't think has been said yet, is it's really important in the work that I do with people. And I think just generally to not pursue improvements in performance or mental game or whatever in poker explicitly or, or exclusively, I should say, mm. that it's very difficult to turn on a skill of investigating your feelings, emotions, experience in the game that means the most to you likely. But to take this as something you can do in your day-to-day -day life when something, when you experience tunnel vision in your day-to-day -day life, which we all do, when you experience a slight reactivity, a slight emotional disturbance, a way of viewing the world, a, a collapsing around concepts in your day-to-day -day life, to take, to start growing an attitude of curiosity and of investigation and of presence. And the more that you do that in every area of your life, poker is just another area of your life. It's very unlikely that you become very capable of conquering tilt, for example, at poker or improving your performance at poker if you're ignoring it in every other area of your life. Yeah, it's almost like building a habit of just how you, how do you react when your brain tries to go into that tunnel visioning, um, fight yeah. or flight survival mode? Like, 
are you going to let it suck you into the vortex or are you going to try to actually experience it and, and almost like confront it and and feel whatever yeah. that is so that you can you can move on yeah yeah i mean it's like it's like um and that's what someone asked if poker is zero sum and my answer was no because there's all these other domains of growth and value to be sucked out of poker outside of the financial aspect of it the financial aspect of it is zero sum but other than that but the interesting thing about that is if your tunnel vision if you're viewing poker purely through the lens again of just like i need to make money in this moment mm -hmm. your tunnel vision is clearly becomes an ob an, a, a a barrier to that mm -hmm. but if you're trying to engage in life in a fulfilling and rewarding way all the time then your tunnel vision can actually become an exciting opportunity to investigate and understand yourself more and and there's there's more than one game being played here yeah, it might be the case that you're just not going to play this hand well, but every time you get tunnel vision is an opportunity for you to learn more about why you tunnel vision. And the only air place where that data is to be found is not, it's not me. It's no, no coach can tell you it's in the experience in that moment. And one of the things that you'll learn, the more you try to be present and explore yourself is that you are just this receptacle of constant change. And so the only moments to learn why you tunnel vision are in the moment you're feeling it. So like in the moment you're feeling it, there's actually this sort of like rich excitement over, I've been wanting to learn why I do this, right? And, and now here's the opportunity for it. And as soon as this tunnel vision leaves, that opportunity is gone because now you're experiencing something totally different. And even your memories are colored by, again, this moment, your memories aren't that experience. And so the present is the only place for the for that investigation to be done and so whenever you're whatever difficult feelings you you deal with when those feelings arise there's a relationship that can be built with them where it's like it's, it's almost thrilling it's exciting like here's this opportunity and as soon as this feeling goes which it will that opportunity has gone and so to, to really capitalize on and then there's a you know joseph goldstein a, another teacher that i like you know he used to say don't waste your suffering you know, don't waste your suffering. Like when you, when, when something comes up and it's causing you to suffer and we all just want to live happier, more fulfilling lives. And then moments of suffering is where the secrets for how to do that lie. Yeah. And it's the time when we least want to actually open that kind of worm. So it's the time we feel the yeah. biggest resistance to doing it. Yeah. 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 And that's why it can help to make sure other domains of your life are being supportive of that. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, it, obviously, when you come to be present, if what's there is just pain and misery and you're, you know, there's this clinical term called suds, your subjective units of distress. So like if your subjective units of distress are just way too high, it's worth building. And, you know, I help people develop some practices to help reduce those. So it's not it's not always confronting everything, regardless of what it is. Um, it's just. It's just dealing, it's it's finding this balance between how do I confront what's happening, but also knowing myself well enough to also tune down the distress to a workable level. So can I can I can I lower this distress to a level where I can actually deal with it and then I can get to work? But sometimes we don't have that option. Sometimes it's just it's here, it's up, it's high, and then the moment's just and then it's just okay, let's just we're just gonna do our best and and hang on. Mm -hmm. So Chai um, MS. How can I sign up for a one to one help? Um, yeah, so you can I have a website going live soon. Um, it's currently being designed, but you can either message me here. You can message me um, on uh, Twitter. You can email me. I'll just throw my email in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, you can also jump on a call with us right now if you want to ask a question and, and chat with Jared. You That's can jump on a fun. call right now. Yep. Does anyone want to jump on a call? I think we're getting a little bit of like, no one really wants to go first. Um, yeah. What was it? Which the is reasonable. Garment said, some of us are shy and very English talking about our mental state or mental deficiencies is terrifying. Yeah, you can keep it quite light. You can keep it quite poker related for now. If there's a specific like poker problem you're dealing with at the tables, like something you wish you could get a, a feel for, Lamb Stockmix oh. will jump on. Lamb Stockmix is a huge troll though, but maybe he's uh, he's a last year. He's going to want to talk about mustard. So. Yeah, he said talk about mustard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He he literally <laughs> will as well. He'll jump on and say Coleman's mate, and he'll just he'll talk about mustard. Coleman's the type of mustard we get over here. <laughs> he messages me like uh, once every few days, just saying Coleman's mate. So. 
What's his deal with mustard? I don't know. He just gets weird loops in his head, and then he has to like act them out every 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 so often. You can jump on though, yeah. You can you can jump on that. Macker hacker can jump on as well. You're all very scared. Well, why don't we? Why don't we? Um, I tell you what we'll do. We'll put a link. We'll put the link to the call in the Twitch chat. Is that a dangerous idea, Jared, or do you think that's an okay? Well, idea? You get to approve them, right? You get to approve them. I get right? to approve so... them. There's a waiting room, so that seems like kind of safe, right? So, I want to know. Mzox, no. Mzox, is not too late. Or you can jump on, or no, not too late at all. You're not too late. We just did a, a ranting, um, bit of back and forth for a while, but this is the Zoom link. So, the, and for those of you who are curious, also, I know there the 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 uh, subscription uh, video library is being built on Care Corner. I'll yep. be doing videos there. I have about five videos I'm working on to release there as well. Yeah, so so Jared's going to be kind of making some performance mental game presentation based content there. We're going to have technical coaches making a lot of stuff. I'll be making some premium stuff on there as well. So that's going to launch from March 1st and we're very excited. It's going to be about £50 per month and there's going to be at least three videos per week. Sometimes more videos are going to be like longer than YouTube content. So plenty of value for money on there um, coming to you from March 1st when it launches. There will be a a stash of videos pre-recorded. A couple of years might be up there by then, Jared, as well. Zoom link is for jumping on the call and talking to us right now, basically, as Jared says. Yeah. So who wants yeah. to have first come, first serve, basically, right? So we've already got someone in the waiting room. We have Mark, so let's go ahead and let Mark in. Is is who's Mark? I is think Mark, Mark is Macker Hacker, mustard? probably. No, not oh. the mustard guy. The mustard guy is, is is very, very strange guy. Um that's not him. He's got posters of mustard up on his, his bedroom, you know, like teenage girls have posters of boy bands and stuff. He has posters of like a jar of mustard. That's amazing. I lied about the second part, but it's probably true. It could be true. Yeah, I, 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 I put that together, fortunately. This is close to a mustard hoodie. Okay, Um. so it says that Mark is here. Are you here, Mark? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. How are you getting on? Yeah, good. Thanks, mate. Good, thanks. Hi, Jared. How are you? Good, how you doing, man? Good, good, good. So it looks like so when, when either of you speak, the person who's speaking will just come up on screen, which is ideal, actually, and I'm just I'm just ever-present because it's my channel. So. Um, Mark, for anyone who doesn't know, is actually from, from Losing to Cruising, the first Coaching Journeys YouTube um, series that we put out about a year ago. Um, over a year ago now, Mark, right? Yeah, just, uh, just over. Yep, so how have you been getting on? Really briefly before we get into your question, how have you been getting on with poker since losing to cruising? Um finished. Yeah, pretty good. I'm I'm on an iPad here, so so sorry if the quality mm. isn't great. Oh good. Um yeah, going pretty good, Pete. Um poker is I'm continuing to play. Um I've I think I'm probably close to cruising. Um we might do a YouTube soon to to establish whether that's the fact or not. But uh yeah, no, like I, I've, the journey has been, uh, has been great. I, you do, you gave me a lot of help, um, and I went back over a lot of the stuff, um, just to to try to bed it all in because it was quite. Uh, what I, one thing one thing that uh, I guess you you may have touched on already is when you're you're trying to learn so much and, and unlearn so much in a short period of time, it 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 can be very challenging, um. To, to, to actually do that uh, effectively so you do have to go back and you know relook at stuff and remind yourself uh, what you learned previously and have since forgotten so um yep. that, that that's definitely been an issue but uh but yeah i still playing a lot still loving poker and uh yeah looking forward to getting back on uh youtube to go through some hands at some point Awesome, yeah. So you'd show me some of your results um, on Discord a few weeks ago and they did look like things were headed in the right trajectory. So that's it's really great to hear. Um, I I think back at the start, there was a lot of dismantling that had to be done and there were so many concepts that had to be disassembled in your game before we could really build um, the right stuff in there theoretically. But let's move to the the sort of performance mental game side of things like what are your thoughts on on that and do you have a specific like mental game or performance issue that you've been struggling with somewhat yeah and, and it's an it, like it's an old one it's it's the old and it still returns sometimes so the old um urge to call uh, uh and the the urge to call that that by like i i learned through working with you 
you know, the protocol of, let, let's say, bl bluff catching on the river, the protocol of checking what you're, you know, how much, how much are they bluffing and going through that protocol. Is this an overbluffed or underbluffed spot? Um, and that, but I still, I still am challenged sometimes to actually go through that protocol. <laughs> That's my dog. Unfortunately. Sorry. Sorry, you, you let Coco out, please. Sorry, apologies. Coco's. That's okay. Few, Coco's, few moments of fame. Coco's yeah. just seen a squirrel or something. So fair enough. I mean, squirrels are. <laughs> yeah. Coco's fair fully enough. like mode one gates are fully open here for Coco, like fully experiencing the the squirrel <laughs> and all of its raw detail. I would say. All right, um, Jared. Any any advice for Mark then on that particular issue? Is that an issue that you've come across a lot with poker players? Yeah, let me just ask you a bit more. What what kind of situations have you found? Um, like, if there were a common thread amongst your spots where you find that to be difficult, what what would that be? Um, I think the common thread would be uh, significant uh, money at stake. Uh, mm. So typically on the river. Um, so it's typically a big bet facing a large bet and I need to decide whether to fold and let go of the hand and let go of the pot that's sitting in front of me or call. And yeah, as I said, I've, I, I learned the protocol, it's, you know, to go through, but yeah. I sometimes, buy it, you know, the best with the best intentions and the best will, I still sometimes bypass it and press the call oh, yeah. button before going through the protocol that I know of. So let's let's put the the protocol aside for a moment because I think I think again if we try to tense too much around a way of thinking in moments where we're feeling very emotional, we're likely to just flare up the exact kind of thing that we've been talking about, which is just more conceptualization. Okay. So I guess what I would ask you is what does that feel like in those moments? When in those moments where you're you're not wanting, are you feeling I can, I can put a couple of possibilities out there that are coming to mind. Like, is it is it a fear of making the wrong fold? Is it a desire to win the pot? Is it, what's kind of going on there? Um, it, it, I find this hard. So I find it hard uh, to, to, to put my finger on that. Uh, even when mm -hmm. I kind of need to think about it in the moment um, when it's happening, just to put my finger on what exactly is the urge. And, but it's probably it's probably a mixture of curiosity. It, it's and it's also the old. Um, I feel like I'm being bettered here, and mm, yeah. I'm bettered. So okay, so then just with that, just so we don't take too much time. There's a um, I'll say this and hope that it's useful. Um, this is limited information, so you know it can only be as useful as that. But the two things that you mentioned is the fear of being bettered. And the curiosity, I find curiosity is is less curiosity and, a, and an uncomfortability with not knowing, which is different, right? Like curiosity is really a matter of it's it's interest, it's open, it's it's free with whatever is the case, but it, but a discomfort with not knowing that we made a good fold, mm. right? It's it's really we want to know. We'd rather the the sort of EV, if you will, that our brain is calculating is that not knowing if we made a bad fold here is worth more to us than knowing that I made a bad one, a bad call, right? And so really what I would point your experience to in those moments, instead of like, okay, what's the protocol? How do I do this? But it's, can I open to this feeling of not knowing and just, I'm not going to know. And can I, can I start learning to be more comfortable with just, I'm not going to know in spots and there's going to be, I'm going to get outplayed in tons of spots. I'll be outplayed, but that doesn't mean I can't outplay other people in other spots. That's not in my control, what their strategy is. And outplayed is, is a story. It's a story about their skill, what's happening, them bluffing and you folding does not mean you are outplayed, right? And and really internalizing that feeling that, that, that what I'm what my fear is is that I will fold and they will be bluffing that there'll be money to make here that I won't get because I was wrong, and learning to open to that feeling and you can just start telling yourself when you face that bet it can be really useful to just start saying, saying or in your head saying okay, I I feel uncomfortable, just starting just being honest like I feel uncomfortable, I I don't want to lose 
right? I don't want to be wrong. I want to be a good player. And just start saying these things that you're feeling in that moment and just can, just being honest with yourself. This is where I'm at. I don't have to pretend this isn't the case, right? I, I want to win this pot. I want to be a good player, right? I want, I, I don't want to make a mistake here. And, and it's really uncomfortable to not know if I made a mistake. And then just saying that, I think you'll find, just confronting that itself, you'll feel a lot more ease immediately. And step one, anytime we're feeling something strong, before we start saying, okay, what's the protocol? How do I do this? Step one is, can I be present with my feelings, right? And some part of you, what's actually happening here is interesting. It's a, actually something you can trust really deeply. This fear of not knowing comes up because the intuitive part of you says we should fold. It already knows that. That's yeah. why this fear is gripping you is because this intuition's rising up that this is not a spot I should call and it comes up immediately. And this forecasting of the future of not knowing is actually, well, funny enough, the very thing that's going to make you a great player. This instinct of we should fold. And now if we can open to the fact that that means we're not gonna know tons of times. And opening to not knowing is one of the most important parts of being a good poker player. Because when we can start saying, I don't know, that's when we can start being creative, start being, start really dealing with the complexity of the situation that we're in. Players who need to know are the players who are, who are gonna make tons of mistakes, right? So just starting to open up to that feeling. And again, it can really help to just start with your feelings. Don't start with the protocol. Don't start with logic. Don't start with that. Just start with, what am I feeling? Can I open to this? Can I accept it? These things matter to me. There's nothing wrong with that. It matters to me that, I, that I'm not wrong. It's really scary to not, to not know because yeah. I want to be a good player and th yeah. that's okay. And then just go from there. Cool. That sounds great. Yeah, I'll give that a go. I absolutely yeah. love that, awesome, bit, by the way, about if it was an easy call, if it was just a case where like villain half pots the river in their obsession, they have a really wide range and you just know that you're winning more than the 25% of the time in this spot and you've called yeah. and you know cleaned up EV in that spot all the time, you don't actually experience that inner turmoil, that battle, that resistance. You don't feel that fear of not knowing because no one has suggested folding to you. But when yeah. you're mode one, when, when you feel that battle, when you feel that resistance and that friction and you go into that tunnel vision and you've experienced that pain, it's because mode one has said, hey, I think this is a fold, and then the limbic system is kicked in and it's basically flagged up a ton of potential issues with folding, one being the uncertainty, yeah. others being bested in the hierarchy of humans and having your resources yeah. taken and not having firewood or food. And then your brain then goes, well, fuck, we better start telling some stories and it goes full mode three. And I can really see now with that example, why mode three, why mode two is an extension of mode three actually. Rather than an yeah. rather than some distorted mutation of mode one, mode one is saying we should do this, and then it's actually yeah. mode three that's going. Ah, hold on a minute, you've given me an idea I don't like. I need to push back. If there's no idea you don't like, there's no pushback. The idea you don't like is folding, and therefore it only happens where folding's already been suggested by mode one in some way. I think that's like so powerful yeah. that revelation. Yeah, one one more thing I just want to flag is that like it's 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 self judgment is really the enemy in these moments, right? So like when these, all these feelings start coming up to recognize what, again, another teacher of mine has once sold me was to, to recognize the innocence of all of our instincts, that all of your instincts are trying to look after something for you, all of them, things that matter to you, things you care about, all of them. And so, and it would be nice if all of our instincts were just like perfectly in line and just like marching in one direction. But the truth is most of our instincts are concerned about different things going in every other direction. And so like you feel this tension, you know, being pulled across you in all these different directions. And to just realize that this is not a battle against your feelings, but with them, right? That's the, that's the important thing is that all of these things are presenting you with information. And the more that you can open up to all of it, the more that you can determine what information, what fears, what things you actually want to act on, you know? And so when you notice these things coming up, just recognize, saying that out loud with this side of kindness of like, I care about this. I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to do this, right? That kind of openness just really primes you to play at your best. Um, and like I said, just remember the innocence of all of your instincts. Yeah. Yeah, nine to five makes a really good point here as well that, that's easy when you're playing your A game and it's easy when like you're feeling quite relaxed yeah. and calm. But as soon as you start 
feeling threatened by losing a few stacks and making a few mistakes and having a bad time of it it becomes increasingly impossible for the untrained player to actually achieve any of that right and i guess that's just something you have to slowly work towards through practice well it's also important to say that these are not techniques for fixing a difficult moment that's not what this is this is not a difficult moment okay now we do this this is a way of engaging with life and as much as we possibly can and also if if not life the moment we go to play, calm hands, exciting hands, dull hands, hands we win, hands we lose, hands, all of it. We're trying to be present and open and aware and all of it. Yes, it's extremely difficult when you've been autopiloting a session and you get into a difficult spot and like oh, you're like, now I want to be present and, and mindful and all of this. Yeah, there's a lot there. For one, I would, I, in this particular situation, I almost guarantee that the energetic signature of this anxiety comes way before the moment you're in that spot. I bet on the flop, pre-flop, you're anticipating the potential for this to happen and you can already feel it and you're already tensing. And then when it happens, you're like, fuck, I knew this was going to happen. Right. And so if you can be present though, when, when you're, when your sympathetic nervous system is just ramping up and you can calm it in that moment by being like, it's okay, we might get into a tough spot that's okay. Right. Um, that's where, again, it becomes much easier because you're not waiting for this to ramp up and then saying, okay, now what do I do? (laughs) But it can still happen. You, that's going to happen to you. You're going to not notice that you were ramping up in these emotions. They're going to come on you all in a moment. But again, the response then is kindness. It's acceptance. It's, it's recognizing that this hand already might be one that we play poorly. Now, can I just not let it affect my well-being, my day, my life, my whatever? This is just one hand and can it can mean a lot to me, but can I respond to myself with kindness now that I'm here? Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's almost That's like- great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, George. Yeah. All right, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks for coming on. It's almost like that, that autopiloting your way through a hand where you're becoming gradually more and more uncomfortable is just to be gradually sucked into the the vortex of of type <laughs> two slash three thinking so just being yeah, able I mean, to become like, present you know it's like that's like what we don't see we become right that's, yeah, that's exactly. a really important thing what we don't see we become and so like slowly as you start to practice being present your sort of threshold for me it's just the threshold of suffering because with all of these feelings, there's a little bit of suffering attached to it. Mm-hmm. And the threshold of suffering that causes you to sort of draw your attention to like, what am I doing? Like, go, it just gets lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. And soon, just even the slightest amount of suffering will elicit the response in you to be more present, to be more kind to yourself, to be more here. Um, and it's and and that's really where... You know, that's the more when the when the threshold, when you sort of your alarm of presence is is a very low threshold, that's where you kind of operate more like at at just higher levels more often. You're just performing at your best because it takes very little to sort of disturb you and notice like, oh wait, what am I feeling? Oh, I'm there's something going on here. I need to be present with it. You're on your guard basically. You're not gonna be duped yeah, by yeah. by the the sympathetic yeah. nervous system as easily. You're not gonna be yeah. you know, bulldozed by it. Okay. Awesome stuff. Let's let M. Zocked in. Um, a bit wary about this because I believe M. Zocked is a guy that's been hunting all over Scotland for me so he can track me down and I, I guess kill me. I don't know if he said that explicitly, but he's he certainly posted uh, pictures of him um, with his daughter, his five-year-old daughter, I believe, is his accomplice who's also looking to hunt me down and, and kill me. So we'll get him on the show and we'll, we'll find out a little bit about that and also hear what his mental game concerns are. I have no idea what we're walking into right now. Me neither. <laughs> M sucked. How's it going? I hope it's connecting to audio. We're not there yet. Ah. Oh boy. I think this is the Still same guy. Maybe I got it wrong. It'd be really awkward if this isn't the guy that sent me those um, emails about hunting me down. I think it is. We're not, we are, we're, we're slow on connecting to audio here. Suspense. It's, it's, it's well, exciting. We'll let that happen. Um, we keep an eye on that. Um, is this podcast also recorded for YouTube? It is going oh, to be I think available. We might be on... good with him. I think we might be good with him. Oh, are you, are you there, man? I'm sucked. 
I don't know. We just see. A, I just see him staring at his what must be his phone. No, I don't hear him. Yeah, we don't hear you. We can see that you've joined the call, but we don't hear you, man. Can't hear you at all. M my must. We'll play a game of uh, charades here. Charade us your your mental game problem. The thing is, he doesn't appear for the audience until he speaks, though, so that doesn't really work. <laughs> He's not even appearing. I don't even have the zoom open. I just see you. Can't okay, hear we'll, you. we'll give you a few minutes to try and fix the the connectivity there with the audio settings. Go to the arrow at the bottom left and go to your audio settings. Make sure it's using the right mic. Sometimes Zoom uses a the wrong default mic or some mic that doesn't exist or whatnot. Um, what were we saying there? I don't know if he can hear us either, though. Um, ASL, that'd be nice. No, we, we can't, can't hear you, man. No. I don't know if he can hear us either. No, it doesn't seem that way. Um. But yeah, super interesting stuff. Yeah, try over the PC. That's fine. I have about 30, 30 minutes, twenty seven minutes, and then yeah, I'm gonna have I'm to the run. Same. I'm the same. Yeah, no worries. We won't go. We won't Perfect. go past six o'clock. So main takeaways for me so far are just that, like, what I thought was mode two and mode three are actually like way more intertwined than I realized. I'm also taking away like a lot more about how certain instincts I had about how it feels to be playing well are very linked to like what you're saying we should shoot for yeah. as well so like a lot of stuff I've been trying to coach people on well I don't have like the you know the knowledge to frame it as you have I've certainly been hitting upon yeah. many of the same things without using like the same terminology I think so so that's kind of cool but yeah really eye-opening stuff so far today do you guys have any other questions in chat just well or does anyone else want to come on while we're waiting for MZOC to sort his audio stuff out can we repost, repost the link? link. Uh, I don't know if I even have that. I have it. Okay. Yeah, we can, I can do that. Oh, I beat you. I'm too fast. God damn it. Oh. This guy's too good. You're probably younger than me. you got better reflexes. That's the problem. <laughs> that's, that's the How old are you? I'm 37 now. I'm old. Yeah. I am younger than you. Yeah. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be too difficult. I th I've been putting okay. moisturizer on my face the last couple of mornings, though, so I think I look about 27 now because of that. Yes. So. <laughs> I wouldn't have guessed 37. You do look younger than 37, but maybe you just have not high def enough a camera for me or <laughs> No, I think I think I've just um managed to forge a path in life that's so easy that I don't really like suffer the the same kind of aging that like the coal miners suffered in the 30s and stuff like that. You know, I'm just kind of a bit better at aging yeah. cuz I sit on this chair and talk about poker all day and and then like chill Fair. out a lot. So you're 37 yeah, my fuck? So yeah I'm, I'm, I'm definitely passing for for younger here this is excellent I'm, i used to be a i remember the days when people thinking you were younger than you are was like undesirable and now it's like the most desirable thing in the world so how things change yeah. M's up, and he's, he's, again he's... i'm gonna kick out the other version of him i'm not having two of them in here i object to that i remove that That's one fair. reason i'll tell you later that's what it says that's the default is i'll tell you later our trust and safety team will send you an email to request Jesus. It thinks that he's like a terrorist or something. Maybe it knows more about him than, than I do. Right. We're letting you in on your computer now, Mzot. You are in the call. Let us we're know when you're connected to, to again. audio. Okay. Oh, you... Are we there? Hello? Yes. yes he's here. Hello. Here. How's it going? He can't hear us though. Oh God. No, I just need to. We hear you. That's great. Unfortunately, I don't hear you yet, uh, but that could be off my headphones. Even Zoom, Zoom will be using the wrong thing, almost certainly. If you go to the this a little oh, arrow and so Zoom, stressy. then set he can't hear. He can't. He can't hear you, buddy. I'm being uh, really stupid right now. Um, go <laughs> to Zoom. OBS is your screen, right? Settings. Go to Zoom sound settings. Yeah. And... I love that. The, that was so I love the phone describing how to fix <laughs> problems of him not hearing us to yeah. his ears. <laughs> not works. Check, check. Can you hear us? Is that good? That sounds no, good. No, I close Twitch. You can hear us now? Now I can hear you. Great. Okay, perfect. Ah, we're, we're in. Lucky. All right, let's go. So, first question is um, how is the hunt? through Scotland going? Have you managed to track me down yet? And how close are you? 
Um, it's difficult. Hmm. Military <laughs> technique we created by AI. So I crafted something with my daughter together, as you know already. Mm-hmm. But it's super difficult, Pete. You're that's, hiding so perfect. I mean, we just hear. see your room in the back room. Yeah, I'm, like... I'm making sure I keep this carton fully closed <laughs> here so you don't get to like get, get an image. It looks like street. a bunker. Yeah, yeah first of all, uh, thanks for having me on for this quick moment. And you guys are really, really um, two great coaches I really look up to. So that's a great oh, moment. Thanks. Very special for me, to be honest. And uh, oh. Pete, re- best regards for my daughter, as you know. She's appreciate it. Kind of mad of you. Oh, that's 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 good, mate. My, my youngest fan, perhaps. Could be potentially. Yeah. Is she going to be a old, poker player able... one day? I hope so. If she wanted to learn the skills, I try my very best. Teach them young. Okay, what's your mental game um, issue that Jared can maybe help you with today? Um, yeah, as you maybe know from my application email, the story is a little bit longer. I try to make it as short as possible. But I want to be really honest because maybe your community gets a deeper look and maybe can see something or own issues, whatever. I'm a kind of guy. I have a cardiologic neurosis. Um, I suffer from panic attacks here and there. I'm in Mm. psychological therapy, but I'm just I'm just fine. But this is like my handicap, I would say. Mm. And it describes me as a character which is very emotional the way he grew up. And I recognized that poker teached me a lot about my emotions uh, when I lose mm. parts, when I, as you discussed m- with Mark earlier, falling into autopilot mode, uh, losing parts, getting aggressive. And I'm the kind of guy in the past who smashed like his, his desk or chair because of angriness, because I was bad at losing from my childhood on. It began mm. very early you, for whatever you. reason. I don't know. Uh, yeah, you got, you got a, you got a 25% and poker highlighted right that there, you know? you uh, issue, I would say, uh, very intense to myself that I started to think about myself, the way I act mm. during a session or my emotional reaction and that kind of stuff. And it got better. But I still have the reflex that I, when I lose for attention, uh, as an example, a pot, I immediately get the feeling to I need to have that back. It's like an ego yeah. thing, you know, like it triggers immediately my ego, like, oh, fuck, uh, two more tables. Now I have to get the stack back. So very irrational thoughts um, where I really work on. I try meditation and stuff. And um, the problem is that I'm a very hectic character. So, so in overall, it's it's a huge issue. But I want to learn how to or to get a perspective to let the ego out of all this. Hmm. Yeah, first of all, thanks for sharing all of that. Like, it's a good background. Yeah, that's that's just, a, it's it's short yeah. story, but I, I thought just, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who's hiding the issue because I think um, that won't help. And maybe it's interesting for somebody out there. Yeah, yeah. So so basically, if I could just make sure I understand this correctly, you, you when you lose big pots, you immediately want to get it back. And, so, and that promotes maybe be- reckless behavior around chasing losses. Is that kind of what I'm understanding? yeah yeah kind of yeah but i think that that it's not uh, it's not about the money or something i guess it's more like the ego who is not really be able to handle losing correctly yeah 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 i mean uh, yeah likely um and so like there's a common experience when i talk to people um who chase losses and this is actually very insightful of you that really what often what chasing losses is especially if the loss was made an error if we feel like we made a mistake and that resulted in a loss that trying to chase a loss is actually about trying to rewrite our mistake right it's actually about trying to like undo the mistake that we made and we think that if we can make that money back there's no evidence of that mistake now we don't have to we don't have to live with that error that we made um so part of it is is that you know when you're saying it's it's an ego thing i i would put this under the microscope a little and i i think there's sort of a negative story happening here where when, when you lose something, a feelings come up around loss, around, around maybe even having made a mistake or, or whatever it is that affects you. And then to say this is ego sort of puts this in a negative light already, Mm -hmm. right? That these feelings are bad. And that if I were a more balanced more mindful or a better poker player or whatever, these things wouldn't affect me. Um, I don't, I I don't think that's the case. I I don't think experiencing whatever you experience around losing a big pot 
is indicative of anything egotistical, anything negative necessarily, that mm -hmm. has to be the case. It is a natural response to loss in a domain of something that you value. Now that that can be feeling like it could be, it doesn't have to be money. It can be status. It can be expertise. It can be skill. Mm -hmm. But again, opening up to the feeling and just the, the honesty and the acceptance of who you are, that these feelings are just indicators of something I care about, that this mind, this body values, and that it means something to them. That doesn't mean we get it, right? Actually opening up to those feelings as, as just what they are is, is part of opening up to wanting something and accepting that that doesn't mean we get that thing. Right, mm -hmm. wanting skill, wanting status, wanting money, and whatever that is, the only way to really be okay with not getting it is by first accepting that we want it, because all of the pursuit, that all of the reaction from wanting it to try and get that thing back is because we don't like how it feels to want something we don't have. Mm -hmm. Right, the feeling of wanting something we don't have is too uncomfortable to us. And so I need to go get it. And so starting off with just saying of just this isn't, this isn't an ego thing. This isn't a negative story. This is just my feelings representing something I want. And I can learn to be, to accept those feelings of want. And that w the feeling of want doesn't have to mean I get it, but it's just an indicator. It's just an indicator of what I want to pursue. And, and, Opening to that, I think, is how we stop having reactive behaviors, clinging, chasing behaviors to go get those things in the presence of those feelings, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I get that. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, um, what I figured out, especially poker-wise, and I, I watch a lot of uh, Pete's stuff on YouTube, and... Um, I, in my perspective, he's a very rational guy from how he talks about poker. And this is very inspiring. And, and I try to adopt that. And yeah. what I figure out when I got more, like it was discussed earlier with Mark, I think a bit, is like when you have the confidence or let's say poker-wise more knowledge about the game that doing studies and getting better in the theory yeah. that already gave me the little shift of mindset where I recognized, hey, when you when you um, are better in spots, like, for example, I don't know, three bed pot or whatever, and you figure out a new mechanic or whatever, and it, then I, I'm already be able to say, hey, you played that correctly and the outcome, yeah. you can nothing do about it, you know? Yeah. And I think, I don't know how much into the topic and your advice gave uh, personal secureness also comes into play with that. Yeah. Yeah. A, a lot. I think the same thing, right? Like we want to feel even that like for, for feeling confidence to make it easier to cope with a loss, that's just conditioning. That's just saying I, when I like confidence, I feel like I have this thing, I have this expertise. So the loss doesn't affect my feeling of, of loss in expertise. But when mm -hmm. that goes away, now it's harder to, this loss now hurts me. Because I feel the expertise is, at, is being threatened. And it's all about having a, a strong sense of self-worth outside of any particular thing that is true about us. You know, be it expertise or money or safety. Safety is really just a matter of feeling valued, right? Like if we feel valuable, that, that makes us, we feel very safe. We feel like we mm -hmm. will be protected by ourselves, our community, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so... One thing I want to flag that I heard you say is that like Pete's a, you know, Pete's a really rational guy. I think it's really important to always, this, this affects poker a lot, is to always understand you can never really take people's words for what, what is their experience, right? And so, mm -hmm. yes, there can be people who are really powerful communicators. That doesn't mean your inner life will reflect what it's like to hear them speak when, mm -hmm. when operating the same way they do. Right. And the same way Pete and I have been talking, there's so much emphasis in, in life and culture and Western culture on doing like, what does it do? How do I look like that? And it's all about doing the things that other people are doing. And what I'm trying to fixate people on is, is if there's a player that you respect, there's almost certainly something like it's to be that person. Mm -hmm. Right. And all you can do is be you. 
and from there can promote. And so instead of trying to aspire to think rationally like someone else, I would urge you to try to experience the moment with as much presence and acceptance and openness that the people you respect bring to their game. And then allow whatever thoughts and, and intellect and insights that come from that place, that's how you'll be the best player you can be. And, and, and to relax this sort of tension around trying to think and problem solve and, and, and rationalize the way someone who you respect does. Because if it's not coming from the same, from your place of presence, whatever your place of presence is, it's just words without meaning. It's just, it's just mm -hmm. thoughts without meaning. It, you can't really, right? And so like pr having it be promoted from within you, your insights, your experience, your knowledge, your, that's what matters. And so being present and open to what we have to bring to the game and making this game our own, how I play this game is, is mine, you know, mm -hmm. that's Makes where sense. you're really going to excel and, and you're going to be feel most aligned in your game. Yeah, I think and, that's and a I great think... point. Can I just say one thing on that just briefly before Yo, you come back? Yeah. So thanks. Um, when I'm making a YouTube video and what you're hearing as Jared says, like what you're hearing appears to be lots of rational, logical stuff. It's actually coming from a place of deep immersion and curiosity and free flowing mode one thinking. It's not actually mode three thinking. And while I'm having to verbalize it as quickly as I can, if I'm truly in flow and doing a good job of making a YouTube video, my mouth cannot possibly keep up with what my subconscious is doing because I'm in a free flow curiosity state. So if you then go away and try and minimize openness, minimize sort of that mode one willingness to just embrace whatever you're feeling and you try and force cold dead logic onto it instead and you go into like full mode three, not only will you not be able to replicate my mode three, but as Jared says, it would be coming from a completely different place from the thing you're actually hearing and you would be moving further away from what you're hearing me do and not closer to it. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, and, I mean, uh, just uh, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no. Jared, you, you started. So please go on. Yeah. I, I was just going to say that it's also, you'll probably find the moments that are the most difficult to cope with emotionally are the moments where you were doing it right, but it didn't feel right. Right. Mm -hmm. You were doing the right with emotionally. thing. You were following the, the right where you were steps. Doing it you, were, right. you were doing something and yet some part of you didn't want to do it that way. Some part of you didn't, it didn't feel right. And then it made a decision and, and there was a loss associated with that decision. And now it's like, fuck, I didn't even want to do that in the first place, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so a lot of times the decisions that happen that are the most difficult for us to cope with is when we're trying to do it someone else's way. Whereas when we do it our way and your expertise is just a way of pointing to that, but when we do it our way, regardless of how we're doing it, it really comes with quite a, uh, a, a really lack of, of regret, a deep regret of feeling like we didn't listen to ourselves, you know? And that's mm -hmm. the, the hardest thing to deal with is honestly, when you feel like you didn't listen to yourself. Yeah, and and that that is what I recognize that that nails it on point. Um, what I recognize when I don't know, I, I have no example spot now in my head. But when you what, what Mark told already, like when you're on a river decision, for example, and I get mm -hmm. uh, I bet sin for value, I get raised, as you expect the, the moment when you intentionally um, expected that. Yeah, and rationally, I have the I have the salt in my the spot solved in my head and decided, okay, this is a clear fault in my opinion from what I figured out. But then yeah. click the call button for whatever reason, and you get the bad yeah. news, and you called against your inside feeling, your intention, or your logic. Yeah. And afterwards, I was like, fuck, I yeah. knew it. And and then you um have that very bad feeling like you described a second ago, where you just why the fuck I was acting against myself yeah that kind of thing. yeah yeah and i just want to one thing i want to say because we probably won't have time for another question but it's yeah. it's important to know that after this conversation those moments aren't going anywhere those moments of clicking call when you know you shouldn't aren't going anywhere okay they're going to stick around mm -hmm. <laughs> the question is can we bring in presence and self-compassion after that right so so now we're dealing with this feeling of regret and of self-judgment and the, what we have to do is be present and kind to ourselves whenever we can and slowly move that moment back in time until, it's, until it reaches the hand. Until, and then even before the hand, before that moment, right? Mm -hmm. But the moment you, you click call because it's going to keep happening, again, we don't want to spin into problem-solving mind. 
How do, how do I make sure that doesn't happen again? It's going to happen again, right? We don't want to get into how do I fix this problem with me? It's okay, that happened. It's unlikely to stop happening anytime soon. It's a habit pattern I have. It's just a fact. So mm -hmm. can I be kind to myself at least in the midst of this? Can yeah. I can I can I meet myself with kindness now and just say I'm doing my best and I'm on a and I'm on a path of growth and that's what matters. All right. Yeah. 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 Great advice. Yeah. yeah. There's a real right. tendency with poker players in particular to say the me who's doing all the poker thinking and all the strategizing is some elite emperor and the me who's feeling things and acting on impulse is some kind of like vermin scurrying around the alleyways of my <laughs> mind but it's not actually so a lot of the things that you feel intrinsically and immediately are far more powerful than the logic that you can actually you know sculpt out with a, a you know a paragraph of thoughts as it were so that's you as well you know it's just equally it's equally valuable yeah. that you have those impressions and emotions and ideas than it is that you're capable of thinking strategically or explicitly or with language. They're both equally valid. Awesome. Great. Great, man. Thank you so much for joining the call. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you too. And uh, I keep chasing you, Pete. Keep my Don't curtains closed. <laughs> I, I, I won't be quiet until it happens. Yes. I mean, <laughs> at least, I won't, at least I won't know anything. You know, at least at least it sounds to me like it's just going to be like a bullet in the head from from a sniper rifle or something. So it sounds like you're going to be you're going to be humane about the murder at least if such a thing is not an oxymoron. <laughs> All right. Thanks for letting Take me it easy, man. And, uh, have a great evening and uh, yeah, maybe talk to you soon. Yeah. I don't know. See you soon. Thanks yeah, we'll a lot, let guys. You, we'll let you get back to your, your chemical drug lab that you've got there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> See you, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks so much, yeah. Someone said in chat that it looked like um, he was making meth or something like that. Was a, yeah. How was Jesse it, 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 in, um joke? It had, a bit of those, it had a bit of those vibes, huh? Yeah, really nice guy though. Thank you for coming on, man. That was great. Um, yeah, thanks so, so much. So yeah, this has been great. I guess we'll wrap this up now. Um, yeah, is this some kind of Scandinavian humor about threatening to kill someone from afar? Um, maybe I don't know. I mean, as a, as a Scot, there's quite a lot of that kind of banter <laughs> in our in our culture as well. Not like killing, but like it's you know you roll with the punches somewhat. So I get it. I get yeah. it. I'm I'm not a snowflake. I'm not going to go see my therapist because some guy online said he was going to hunt me down. Like it's okay. I'll see my therapist <laughs> about other things, but, but not that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. So, um, Jared, anything you want to say about your stuff, your services, anything you want to promote? This has been yeah. Great. Uh, I have a website coming soon. Just at um, jaredalderman.com. There's a placeholder there. Please don't visit it. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, it's there. It's fine, but we're improve. We're gonna improve that website for sure. And then, um, yeah, follow me on Instagram uh, at Jared. I don't even know. Hang on, Jared Alderman Coaching. Uh, no, it's just at Jared Alderman, and then on Twitter, um, the Jalderman at the Jalderman with two ends. But yeah, thank you guys so much for listening, and I hope this was helpful. And um. I guess if you anyone have uh, coaching inquiries, you can email me at jared.alderman at gmail.com. I'll throw it in chat. Yeah, we'll really uh, look forward to your content on Carrot Corner with a subscriber. Um, yeah, video library in March. Looking forward to that as well. Yeah, very very excited. Putting a lot of work into it, so I'm looking forward to. It. I think it's I think it's gonna be good content. The PowerPoint so. is ready, by the way. Mark, who you spoke to there, was actually he's actually the guy that designs our PowerPoint, so he's already made. Oh, your I need it. I need it. I have, I'm waiting. Yeah, I'm waiting to to format them appropriately. So I will send yeah. it before I, I wind down for the evening. I will send it as soon as I get off this call Perfect. before I go have dinner. All right, guys, this will be on YouTube Perfect. so you can catch this as well. If you're all right with that, Jared, I'll stick it up on YouTube in a, a week or so and let people watch back the full thing because there's a, a lot of dense information in here. For all of our stuff, it is, of course, carrotcorner.com. We have a YouTube video dropping once per week now just to update you, but that will be back up to two per week pretty soon. And yeah, I'm now back in the office, so to speak. So for anything you want to get in touch with us, just email us at the forum through the website or add me on Discord, carrots, 9127, carrots with a Z. All right, guys, much love. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks again, Jared. Take care, everyone. Yep. Thank you.